I'm Garth Gibson. I'm the professor of computer science and the president and CEO of the Vector Institute here in Toronto. What would you say are the main forces that are shaping the future of work and innovation? Uh, I'd say over the long term in the large, uh, the big trend is to move away from a natural, a natural resources economy in which we pull things from the ground and pluck them from the earth and uh, into a knowledge-based economy in which we use our understanding of the systems and societal patterns to provide enhanced value, productivity, effectiveness uh, for our industries. Mm -hmm. and in that context, um, the, the dominant players are no longer manual labor, they're now technology and uh, data and the ability to apply data to technology. What impact do you expect this to have on Canada's future economy and on our workforce? And with that, are, are we ready? You know, most of us Canadians tend to think that we must be behind. It's just a natural place to be. In fact, we're much better off than we might think. Um, we are already a highly educated society. And uh, we have a lot of knowledge workers today. Um, the CBRE reports will point to uh, how the Toronto Waterloo, Waterloo Corridor is rich in tech skills. Uh, we have the, one of the largest uh, tech workforces. We have uh, one of the, some years, the fastest growing regional uh, um, uh, skill set growth in the tech workforce. And so we're actually pretty well positioned for this with respect to our raw skill set and uh, the populace um, that is uh, flooding to Canada because of our positive uh, immigration patterns and our respect for people of all types. Now, that means we have to utilize that and that requires uh, a certain amount of uh, initiative and desire to compete and desire to perform um, in, in a, on, a, on not only a national stage, but on an international stage. And that is an area where we uh, have not always tried to lead. And I think that part of what we need to do here is to recognize that Canada has leads in particular areas in our workforce, in, in my case, in the artificial intelligence technology, uh, which some of its strongest roots are in Canada and then utilizing those to get out in front and stay out in front. What do you see as the main impact in, uh, of AI uh, in Canada and in particular uh, on which sectors or which part of the economy do you see it um, having the most disruption? You know, uh, artificial intelligence or AI is a broad field. It is a, uh, a science of prediction. It's based on statistical models, it's based on aggressive computer science. And as a result, we have tools that can, with enough training, um, enough data examples, be surprisingly precise in their predictions of information. That is sort of at the front line of this knowledge economy today to allow an organization to better understand itself, to better study its processes, to make itself more efficient, to study its customers in order to know what services they really want, uh, to study a population health in order to identify more quickly what techniques are failing and what techniques might work, um, and generally provide a very broad empowerment of organizations that provide services or take advantage of resources or involved in any kind of uh, automatable, not even automatable, simply recordable technology. So they can improve human processes by recording the information, uh, pointing out where the efficiencies and inefficiencies occur, and allowing the training processes for onboarding employees to get more effective. That all said, how does this affect the future of work? Well, the key thing is that the future of work is dominated by where society goes. And where society goes is dominated by its economies. And its economies are dominated by out-competing. And so now we're at the question of 
in a world in which we compete with one another in order to determine the technologies that are going to be more widely adopted and are going to return better results, how does a, an economy like Canada's economy exploit the technologies that are coming down the pipe and deliver to its uh, organ to its companies workforces that are ready to make the best use of them? And so, in that sense, I think that the this is a question of go to your strengths, outcompete in your strengths, deliver a richer uh, economy, and use that richer economy to fill in the gaps and bring everyone along. And, and that's basically the formula for governing in the country we live in today. And I think that the strengths are coming from our well-trained workforce, our diverse societies, uh, and our willingness to you know, be mathematically trained and take advantage of them. Um, the places we want to double down and, and grow are in the you know, financial services, in the, in the manufacturing bases, in the um, uh, uh, precision medicine, precision agriculture, the, the ways in which we run our society, and that will allow us to compete. And then we fill in. I mean, you, you're right. The future of work, you didn't even say it, but I know you want meant it. The future of work is frequently seen as a, um, a dog whistle to indicate some people might lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I don't want to suggest that that isn't a possibility because economies change. And as economies change, the, uh, the skills that are, that are valued more changes and the skills that are valued less. So what I would say that what we do need to do most in our society is to uh, become more uh, adept at continual learning, that is continually improving our skills, not just for the few years that we are in a training program uh, around our years of 20 and 21 and 22, but throughout our life, uh, finding ways that we can be learning what is changing what, what's happening in my own industry? Where are the new technologies? How can I adapt my skills to better take advantage of those technologies? How can I be part of the group of individuals that are recommending innovation that are allowing my organization to compete? And I think that that continual learning is the main thing we want to achieve in a society that is going to be agile and competitive in a knowledge economy. What are the skills of the future economy? And in particular, if we want Canada to continue to, to, to innovate, but also to commercialize its, its innovations uh, globally, and perhaps with a focus on AI. So people frequently talk about, you know, oil is the, or data is the new oil, or the new gold, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but that leads people to be highly complacent to say, well, we keep records, so therefore we have gold. There are two massive problems with that. The first one is garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't keep good records, if you don't, don't have a path of evaluating your own records and uh, improving what the, the information content that they capture, then you don't have an asset. Um, and generally the way I would say to people is, is that if you've recorded information and you're not using it, it's probably not useful and it's certainly not getting any better. Um, and so the, the, a large number of individuals believe their, their data is massively valuable, in even companies, but they don't really know how to use it. So they're going to sit on it because they're protecting its value. And I would say that in general, if you're not trying to use it, you are not um, improving its value. It may not be useful. And so the, the, there's a need to not just collect data, but actively do something with it. Uh, the second part of this is the tools to, to act on it. Uh, too many organizations, companies, treat this like uh, an opportunity to bring in a specialist for a short period of time to convert their uh, uh, asset, their data, into something that they can then just turn the crank and reliably get improved um, value out of it. And I would say that's not the correct way to view it. The correct way to view it is that your data will need continually uh, to be improved through exploration. And your use of your data is a process of modeling, um, testing, 
and reacting. It's an agile process. So you're going to need to be continually developing, improving your data and continually developing and improving your use of data to, to underpin your organization. And so that's not something in which you call in an expert for a short period of time. They give you back a artifact and then you can just turn it on and it generates assets. What this means is that companies need to change themselves, not hire uh, uh, a ringer for a short period of time. And changing yourself is hard. That's so so that, that is what I think the big challenge for all of us is. How will we... Um, take this continual education, push it all the way through our organizations and develop stronger skills for staying on top of technology. If you have or had 30 seconds to pitch either a person of certain influence or a group um, in Canada, uh, and the goal was to improve skills development for Canada's you know, future uh, innovators and, and ultimately our competitiveness, uh, who would you pitch and what would you say in 30 seconds or less? I would say that the everyone needs practice. We need to create opportunities, experiential opportunities for practitioners in companies, for executives, for professors uh, trained many years ago to, to see modern technology working. My experience is deep learning. To, to, uh, we recently exercise, uh, did a project involving uh, a dozen companies and 30 practitioners for them to experiment with the Uh, modern natural language processing techniques uh, and see how a big natural language model and fine tuning can uh, give you a very powerful um, uh, question answering tool. Uh, that experience uh, has already affected multiple companies in the way their products are developed, the way their employees are developed, the training exercises they do internally. Experiential opportunities. So I would say to government that they want to not just fund academic research by professors in isolation for publication, but ensure that deployment in the hospital is a funded agenda item in the project to ensure that companies have the opportunities um, because there are uh, practitioners that want to show them the, the new technology, be it academic practitioners. Vector does that as a service uh, to our sponsors. Um, the NRC IRAP, Uh, does it to SMEs. Uh, so get your people spending some of their time tracking the new technology, getting their hands dirty and bringing it back into their company to try it at home. That's what I would say. <laughs>